Λοιπόν, καταρχήν να σα καλωσορίσω όλου στην ετήσια εκδήλωση τη Ένωση Αυτοδητών Θεσσαλονίκη. Πολλά καινούργια πρόσωπα και είναι πολύ μεγάλη χαρά που βλέπουμε όλα τι καινούργιε πάτσε σήμερα και μα δίνει κουράγιο να συνεχίσουμε τι δηλώσει μα και την προσπάθειά μα. Ε, εγώ δεν θα σα καθυστερήσω πολύ. Θα, σας πω, θα κάνω μια μικρή ιστορική αναδρομή στην Ένωση Αυτοδητών Θεσσαλονίκη για αυτού που δεν γνωρίζουν ακριβώ τι ακριβώ κάνουμε και ποιοι είμαστε. Και μετά θα συνεχίσουμε με την ουσία τη εκδήλωση και τον κύριο Μαρόνι. Η Ένωση Αυτοδητών Θεσσαλονίκη ιδρύθηκε τον Απρίλιο του 1982 και αποτελεί ουσιαστικά την πρώτη προσπάθεια οργάνωση των εραστεχνών αυτοδητών. Προτεργάτε τη κίνηση αυτή ήταν οι ελάχιστοι εραστέχνε αυτοδίτε τη Θεσσαλονίκη, αλλά από τι αρχέ τη δεκαετία του 1990 μέχρι και το 2007 η Ένωση είχε παραμείνει ανενεργή. Οι προσωπικέ υποχρεώσει και οι αντίξω συνθήκε που αντιμετώπιζαν οι εραστέχνε αυτοδίτε αποτέλεσαν κάποιε από τι κύριε αιτίε αγανοποίηση. Με τον καιρό, πολλέ από τι δυσκολίε που αντιμετώπιζαν έπαψαν να υφίστανται, καθώ άρχισαν να δραστηριοποιούνται στον χώρο καταρτισμένοι επαγγελματίε εκπαιδευτέ και να εφαρμόζονται σύγχρονα εκπαιδευτικά προγράμματα, παράλληλα με τη βελτίωση τη νομοθεσία. Αποτέλεσμα, οι αριστεύμενε αυτοδίτε να πληθαίνουν. Τα παραπάνω δεδομένα αποτέλεσαν μερικού από του βασικού λόγου για του οποίου η Ένωση Αυτοδιτών Θεσσαλονίκη ενεργοποιήθηκε εκ νέου. Έτσι και πάλι, ερασιτέχνε, με όλη τη σημασία του όρου, αυτοδίτε με αναρρύθμιτε κατά τα άλλα. Διαφορέ, αλλά με κοινό το ενδιαφέρον και την αγάπη για το υγρό στοιχείο και την κατάδυση, αναβιώσαμε την Ένωση Αυτοδητών Θεσσαλονίκη. Διατηρώντα την ιστορική ονομασία, με εναρμονισμένο καταστατικό στα νέα νομοθετικά πλαίσια, η Ένωση Αυτοδητών Θεσσαλονίκη ξεκίνησε τη δραστηριότητα το Φεβρουάριο του 2007. Η ΑΦ προωθεί την ανάπτυξη τη ραχιστεχνική αυτόνομη κατάδυση με έμφαση στην ασφάλεια και με ευαισθησία στην προστασία του θαλάσσιου περιβάλλοντο. Παράλληλα, αποτελεί περιβάλλον διασύνδεση, ενημέρωση των αυτοδητών και προσφέρει εθελοντικά τη συσσωρευμένη γνώση και εμπειρία των μελών τη τόσο στην κοινότητα των ερευστεχνών αυτοδητών, όσο και στου σχετικού φορεί. Η ανάγκη των ερευστεχνών αυτοδητών να μοιραστούν την αγάπη του για τη θάλασσα διαμόρφωσε του στόχου τη ΕΑΤ. Η ΕΑΤ έχει ω κύριο στόχο την πρόθεση τη ερευστεχνική αυτόνομη κατάδυση στη Θεσσαλονίκη και στην ευρύτερη περιοχή τη Βόρεια Ελλάδα. Παράλληλα, διατηρεί το ενδιαφέρον τη για τι εθελοντικέ δραστηριότητε κοινοφιλού χαρακτήρα. Όπω είναι η προστασία του θαλάσσιου περιβάλλοντο και η παροχή υποστήριξη σε περιπτώσει έκτακτη ανάγκη. Οι επιμέρου σκοποί τη ΕΑΦ περιλαμβάνουν την ανάπτυξη και διάδοση τη κατάδυση, την προάσκηση των δικαιωμάτων των ερευστεχνών αυτοδητών στην άσκηση υποβρυχίων δραστηριοτήτων αναψυχή, τη συνεχή ενημέρωση και επιμόρφωση των μελών του συλλόγου πάνω σε θέματα που αφορούν την τεχνική, την ασφάλεια τον εξοπλισμό τη αυτόνομη κατάδυση, την αναβάθμιση τη εκπαίδευση και των παρεχόμενων υπηρεσιών στου ερευστέχνε αυτοδίτε σε συνεργασία με του επαγγελματίε εκπαιδευτέ. Από του σκοπού και του στόχου τη ΕΑΦ προκύπτουν και οι δράσει του συλλόγου μα. Έτσι, οργανώνουμε ομαδικέ καταδυτικέ εξορμήσει εντό και εκτό Ελλάδα, εκπαιδευτικά σχολεία για τον εμπλουτισμό και τη βελτίωση των καταδυτικών γνώσεων, παρέχουμε στα μέλη μα τη δυνατότητα εξάσκηση βασικών καταδυτικών ασκήσεων σε ελεγχόμενο χώρο πισίνα συνήθω, διοργανώνουμε δωρεάν για τα μέλη ετή και σεμινάρια πρώτων βοηθειών σε συνεργασία με τον Ιθρό Σταυρό και τον ΙΚΑΒ, οργανώνουμε ετή και ομιλίε ευρύτερου καταδυτικού ενδιαφέροντο. Με οδηγό την ευαισθησία και την προστασία του θαλάσσιου περιβάλλοντο, οργανώνουμε και συμμετέχουμε σε καθαρισμού ακτών και ρηθών, οργανώνουμε και συμμετέχουμε σε διαγωνισμού υποβρύχη φωτογραφία. Συμμετέχουμε σε ομάδε επίση εργασία υπό την αιγύρα του Υπουργείου Πολιτισμού με στόχο τη βελτίωση του μορφητικού πλαισίου των καταδίσεων στην Ελλάδα. Επίση, συμμετέχουμε στο σχεδιασμό τη τοπική αυτοδιοίκηση για την αντιμετώπιση εκτάκτων αναγκών και φυσικών καταστροφών. Στόχο μα για το άμεσο μέλλον είναι η συνέχιση και ο εμπλουτισμό όλων των δραστηριοτήτων μα. Η προσέλκυση και η ενεργή συμμετοχή νέων αυτοδητών με το ίδιο πάθο για τη θάλασσα και την κατάδυση και τη δημιουργία μέσω αυτού μια μεγάλη καταδυτική παρέα. Όλα τα μέλη και οι φίλοι τη ΕΑΦ έχουν τη δυνατότητα να επικοινωνούν μεταξύ του μέσω τη ιστοσελίδα και του φόρουμ του Συλλόγου. Σε γενικέ γραμμέ, για να συνοψίσουμε, η ΕΑΦ είναι μια παρέα φίλων του βυθού που έχει σαν σκοπό τη διάδοση και την ανάπτυξη τη κατάδυση, μια παρέα ανθρώπων με τερόκλητη κουλτούρα αλλά μεγάλη συνοχή στην ευαισθησία προ το βυθό, το υδάτο με περιβάλλον και τι δραστηριότητε του φόρουμ. Έτσι λοιπόν, στα πλαίσια των δράσεων μα, για ακόμη μια χρονιά, προσπαθήσουμε να παραμείνουμε συνεπεί στην υπόσχεση για ποιοτικέ ομιλίε που αφορούν στην ενημέρωση του ευρύτερου κοινού. Αφορμή για τη σημερινή εκδήλωση ήταν η μετά από πρόσκληση του κυρίου Μεσημέρι, συνεργασία μα με τη Μονάδη Βαρβαρική Ιατρική του Νοσοκομείου Αγίου Παύλου και το Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο Θεσσαλονίκη. Σε αυτό το σημείο θέλω να ευχαριστήσω θερμά τον κύριο Μεσημέρι, τον διευθυντή τη Μονάδα Περβαρική Ιατρική του Αγίου Παύλου, αλλά και ιδρυτή, ιδρυτικού τελέχου και πρώτου πρόεδρου τη ΕΑΦ το 1982. Η συμπεράσταση, η εμπιστοσύνη και η άμερη στη βοήθεια που μα έχει δώσει όλα αυτά τα χρόνια είναι πραγματικά εξαιρετική. Να ευχαριστήσω τον κύριο Καραπάντσιο, 
από το τμήμα χημία του Αριστοτέλειου Πανεπιστήμιου Θεσσαλονίκη για τη στήριξή του και ηθική και ηλική για τη σημερινή εκδήλωση. Φυσικά το Δήμο Θεσσαλονίκη που μα παραχώρησε την αίθουσα. Το Κιλικίου που μα άφησε να κλέψουμε σε εισαγωγικά λίγο ίντερνετ για να έχουμε live streaming όλη τη εκδήλωση. Μια και το ενδιαφέρον για να παρακολουθήσουμε και από την Αθήνα φίλη και από άλλε πόλει ήταν έντονο. Και τέλο, να ευχαριστήσω τον κεντρικό μα ολοκληρωτή, τον Δ. Μαρόνι, για την αποδοχή τη πρόσκλησή μα, τον ενθουσιασμό που έδειξε και αντιμετώπισε αυτή την εκδήλωση. Ε, ο κ. Καραπάνσο θα ήθελα να κάνει ένα μικρό χαιρετισμό. Κ. Καραπάνσο. Και στη συνέχεια, ο κ. Μεσημέρι θα μα προλογίσει το καλεσμένο μα για να ξεκινήσει η εκδήλωση. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Καλησπέρα σα. Με τη σειρά μου να σα καλωσορίσω σε αυτή την εκδήλωση. Να ευχαριστήσω την ΕΑΘ και τα πρόσωπα που ηγούνται των προσπαθειών να κάνουν κάτι τόσο ποιοτικό στη Θεσσαλονίκη και στον χώρο τη κατάδυση γενικότερα. Σα ευχαριστώ για την πρόσκληση να κάνουμε κάτι μαζί, να συνδιοργανώσουμε κάτι τόσο σημαντικό όπω η ομιλία η σημερινή μαζί, μαζί με το Θάλαμο, μαζί με τον κύριο Μεσημέρι. Ε, θα ήθελα και εγώ με τη σειρά μου να καλωσορίσω τον εκλεκτό μα καλεσμένο, τον κύριο Μαρόνι. Θα μου επιτρέψετε να πω και λίγα λόγια στα αγγλικά για να μπορεί και ο ίδιο να εκτιμήσει το καλωσόρισμα. So, Professor Maroni, it's an honor to have you here with us today. It's a pleasure and an honor. Ε, θα ήθελα να ξέρετε όλοι ότι ο κύριο Μαρόνι, εκτό από επικεφαλή του Dan Europe, είναι και ένα ακαδημαϊκό δάσκαλο και ένα ερευνητή. Και αυτέ τι ιδιότητε, ειδικά αυτέ τι ιδιότητε, είναι που θέλαμε στο Πανεπιστήμιο Θεσσαλονίκη να συζητήσουμε μαζί του, να δούμε τι προοπτικέ υπάρχουν σε επίπεδο ακαδημαϊκό, σε επίπεδο δηλαδή σπουδών, μεταπτυχιακών, σε επίπεδο ερευνητικό, σε επίπεδο ανάπτυξη τη καταβλητική έρευνα. So, ο Professor Maroni is also here not uh, representing Dan Europe, but is also an academic teacher and a researcher. And this capacity of Professor Maroni. Uh, we try to, to exploit, we try to discuss with, try to find ways to do something together with Dan Europe and with other uh, European universities. Θα ήθελα και πάλι να ευχαριστήσω όλου όσου σκέφτηκαν και όλου όσου υλοποίησαν τη σημερινή εκδήλωση και όλου εσά βεβαίω για το ενδιαφέρον σα να είστε εδώ σήμερα. Καλησπέρα, αγαπητέ φίλοι και φίλοι. Αισθάνομαι ιδιαίτερη χαρά που βλέπω συγκεντρωμένου ανθρώπου με οποιαδήποτε ιδιότητα που αγαπούν τη θάλασσα και έχουν σχέση με την κατάλυση. Όπω σα είπε και ο προλαλή σα πρόεδρο τη ΕΑΔ, πριν από 32 χρόνια είχε ξεκινήσει μια παρέα αριστεχνών που αγαπούσαν αμυγό την κατάλυση και τη θάλασσα να δημιουργήσουν ένα σύλλογο στον οποίο είχα την τιμή και εγώ να συμμετέχω εξ αρχή. Μέσα τη προσπάθεια του λόγου αυτού προωθήθηκε και η δημιουργία των δικλείδων ασφάλεια για την κατάρτιση, που είναι η δημιουργία μια υπεροβαρική καταδυτική μονάδο. Έτσι, δέκα χρόνια μετά το 1982, άρχισε στον Άγιο Παύλο η λειτουργία τη μονάδο υπεροβαρική ιατρική, η οποία ήδη έχει συμπληρώσει περίπου 21 χρόνια αμυγού παρουσία. Με τον ομιλητή έχουμε μια συνεργασία εδώ και 20 χρόνια σε διάφορα επίπεδα στην Ευρώπη. Ο κ. Μαρόνι είναι εκτός από πρόεδρος της ΔΑΝ, μιας οργάνωσης με 500.000 περίπου μέλη παγκοσμίου, αντιπρόεδρος της Ευρωπαϊκής Επιτροπής της Ευρωπαϊκής Ιατρικής και μέλος σε διάφορα συμβούλια και εταιρείες που έχουν σχέση με την κατάδυση. Θεωρείται ένας, α, μια αυθεντία στον χώρο, και η παρουσία του στη Θεσσαλονίκη έχει σκοπό όχι μόνο τη συνεργασία με τη μονάδα και την έρευνα που διεξάγουμε μαζί με τον κύριο Καραπάντση και το Αριστόλιο Πανεπιστήμιο, αλλά πλέον τη δημιουργία αμοιβών σχέσεων όσον αφορά την έρευνα και την εκπαίδευση. So, uh, I have the honor and privilege to present Professor Maroni, who is a, a, mostly an old friend, distinguished colleague, and uh, a uh, approved personality in the area of diabetic medicine. He came here to help us and uh, collaborate with us in many fields concerning education, research, and mostly safety of the dining society. So, please, Professor Maroni, you can come and have your presentation. Thank you.
Καλησπέρα. And that's all my Greek. The other Greek I can speak is ancient Greek. And the last time I read it was 50 years ago when I, when I came out of high school. But I did study it. And I can still read it. It's, it's a great honor. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, not only because Todoris, uh, Theo, is a very good old friend of mine. But uh, because I'm not here to help, I'm here to collaborate. Uh, you don't need help. You, you are an authority in diving and, and hyperbaric medicine. And after all, this is where the first known diver in history was born. If we all remember Norbeg Alexandros enterprise in the bell. So it's an honor to be where it all started, in a way. Uh, I have been asked to speak about two things uh, this evening. One is Dan and what is Dan. And I'm very pleased about to, to speak about that. <coughs> Sorry, but <coughs> I like to move around. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak about it because this is something that, that I had the honor and pleasure to uh, found 33 years ago, together with my good friend Dr. Peter Bennett in the United States, uh, what, what is it? What is the Divers Alert Network? Uh, we are an international body, uh, non-profit foundation, helping divers in distress. Uh, but we're also conducting research to prevent diving accidents and to improve the knowledge of uh, diving physiology and the prevention of diving accidents. We are part of an international uh, federation of five organizations, five uh, sister organizations. One is Dan Europe, the other one is Dan America. We two were the initiators 32 years ago together. And then Dan Japan, Southern Africa, and Australia Pacific joined. Uh, the, pri the primary mission was to generate uh, and to start a hotline. That is a 24 hour a day readily available phone number where divers in distress could call anytime, any day, and reach a specialist in diving medicine. The second mission was to work to prevent injuries by learning from injuries and by learning what should not have been done. And the third important mission is to promote diving safety coming out of the experience that we all have. Therefore, DAN is essentially a medical organization which developed into an organization to assist divers, but essentially and primarily it's a medical organization joining international experts in diving medicine to staff the 24-hour hotline, but also to collect data for good sound epidemiological research in diving medicine, to promote diving medicine education through courses in diving medicine, but also in first aid, uh, to promote uh, awareness of diving safety amongst the uh, medical, uh, the, not only the medical, but also the diving population, to uh, spread this knowledge through uh, medical and scientific publications and to support the international hyperbaric facilities network by assisting, especially not the highly developed ones like the one that you have the pleasure and privilege to have here in, in Thessaloniki, but especially those hyperbaric chambers who work in very remote areas of the world where divers do travel. And we, as part of our mission, visit regularly these chambers, do first uh, uh, safety assessment, risk assessment, training of personnel, and now we are proud of having visited 98 chambers in remote areas. I'm not speaking about European area. I'm speaking about the far away destinations where divers go. As I said, one of our primary mission is also to conduct research. Because out of research comes safety and knowledge. And out of knowledge comes education and then again safety. 
we study mostly anything that involves diving physiology. Therefore, we are very active, and my second presentation will deal with that, in, for example, decompression modalities, decompression algorithms, the safety of decompression, the safety of flying after diving. Uh, we are presently studying the uh, possibility for divers with disabilities, such as diabetes, for example, to dive safely. We have just patented a, an in-water, real-time uh, blood glucose monitor that the diver can look at on his dive computer while actually having a glucose, an interstitial glucose monitor on his own. We did a very uh, long and, uh, and, and successful study on patent foramen ovale and diving, and there is a book that we published, this is a Dan book, <coughs> and many other things. Finish, just to tell you, uh, what we are in now, we are even trying to analyze if there is a genetic predisposition so, to certain uh, diving diseases, and we are finding out that certain genetic polymorphism, that, that certain genes are connected with certain problems. <clears throat> but the thing I'm most proud of <clears throat> in terms of research is the fact that we are doing research with the help of divers. Uh, we are not doing research in a laboratory. We are not doing research, not only in a laboratory. We are not doing research in an ivory tower of two or three scientists. Without the help of divers collecting dives, sending their dives, sending their experience, sending their questionnaires, sending their dive profiles, and being ready to participate in field research camps, we could not have collected as many as almost 250,000 dive profiles complete with questionnaires, Doppler study, electronic dive profile, uh, anamnesis and history of whatever happened all over the world. And we could not have now a data bank which is unprecedented and it allowing us to understand much better what happens in, the, uh, di in, in diving physiology and to divers. This is possible through a system and a program which we call participated research. I have been happy to see that now it is a recognized modality of research. It's called citizen science. It is applicable to archaeology, for example. It's applicable to marine biology and to many other things where data collection is the most important thing. Whereas data interpretation is left to the scientist, but data collection is something that anybody with good training can do. And for example, we are training divers to use Doppler probes and to uh, record, record their Doppler sounds, that is, monitoring bubbles. We are even training divers to do cardioechography. I know that there is a cardiologist here and a cardioechographer, and probably he would be scandalized, but Effective in, 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 in reality, Doppler is music and echography is photography. What makes the change is the interpretation of the signal, and that is, needs a specialist. But taking the picture or, or, and, and recording the music is another story, and by using divers to help us in doing that, we have the numbers. And Everybody knows that unless you have numbers, you cannot do epidemiology. You cannot understand what happens, because small numbers is no data, no certainty. Large number is more safety and more, more secure data. So this is something we are pretty proud of. Another part of our mission is assuring safety. And safety is also done by secondary prevention. Primary prevention is understanding what happens to our physiology and changing it. Secondary prevention is preventing any problem to become worse. That is, being able to provide proper first aid, interpreting any problem, any accident, and providing proper first aid. Therefore, we are very active in promoting courses for the divers <coughs> to be able to intervene in case of accident. We have very many courses we were, uh, fortunately, in uh, almost in 1985, the first ones in the world to promote oxygen, the use of oxygen first aid in case of diving accidents, and then we proceeded with many other courses 
that you can read of on our <coughs> publications and on our website, including some medical education, because we are now also very active in the education, in continuing medical education, with uh, cooperating with the uh, academia, with universities, to train actually doctors to be more aware and to know a bit more about what happens to the diver when the diver dives in the extraordinary environment of the underwater realm. Uh, therefore, we have courses in diving medicine. And we also cooperate with uh, emergency medical services worldwide. By joining Dan, anybody can join the experience which comes from a large group, now worldwide, we are way over 350,000 members, so there are over 350,000 members who join us, who help us, and who help us helping divers. This uh, is what we do for them. We are available with multilingual alarm centers 24 hours a day uh, to assist, advise, organize emergency medical evacuation, uh, refer to medical specialists, interact with many hospitals or uh, medical specialists around the world. Uh, we do so also by offering specific insurance policies that we uh, obtain from specialized insurance companies that are ready to insure the risk. The reason is very simple. Not every country in the world has public health services, like m most countries in Europe. When a diver travels uh, to the Red Sea, for example, or to the Maldives, or to any place outside of European Union, uh, even to America or the Caribbean, unless they can pay, they won't even be accepted in, 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 a, in an emergency room. And even some European countries are now going back. For example, Germany and Spain are not recognized as diving. Accidents are something that will be paid for by the National Health Service. Therefore, if you want to provide good assistance, you need to have the means to do that. And I would not really like to be in the position to receive an emergency call, to understand that the person needs Emergency evacuation needs a helicopter, needs a, an air ambulance, needs a hyperbaric chamber, needs hospital, and I cannot do anything because I cannot assure that this is paid. So I need insurance in order to assist and to provide proper assistance. So what can we do for Greece? We have done something. No, you don't have it anymore. This is surprise. This is the micro surprise that I promised. <laughs> to, uh, so leave it, leave it like that. Uh, what, what can we do for Greece? We have done something already. Uh, all of our first aid courses and training courses are already available in Greek. Uh, there are, we have members who are also uh, qualified instructors and are caring for offering this possibility to the uh, uh, Greek diving population, community. We have our, the, the description of our membership benefits in Greek, uh, also available on the website, both for recreational divers, for professional divers, and also for clubs, because clubs, a club would never get decompression illness. It's quite difficult, but it would get into troubles. <laughs> if someone gets the compression illness. And getting into troubles means needing an insurance, needing a legal assistance, needing someone who understands, needing an advisor, paying in the end, paying from the lawyer on. So we have plans that see for that. We even have a legal network of uh, lawyers who are specialized in, who are divers, therefore they like diving, and they specialize in diving, in legal diving uh, issues. And uh, we promote safety by many other ways, uh, such as, for example, promoting the, an accident due to propeller. Only last year we have 55 injuries caused by propellers 
five of which were fatal, lethal in, uh, accidents. Most of them caused by the same boat where the divers were diving from. Therefore, we are promoting a safety campaign. Uh, we also distribute this flow chart, which can be on a sticker, which can be put on any boat, that gives information on the first things to do and not to do in case of suspicion of decompression illness, uh, how to provide oxygen, what to do, and so on. And this is available in Greek. Uh, we are publishing these very simple common sense safety rules for diving. They are available on our website. And in order to avoid people to be sliced by propellers, we produced this sort of uh, sticker that is followed by a campaign that is available on our publications and, uh, and uh, website. Actually, this is available in 16 languages. All these stickers are free to be asked for, so any, any diver can ask for them. They will receive a pack, of, a pack of this, and they are free to go and stick them around wherever motorists are not aware of the presence of divers. Uh, did we do something else for, for Greece? Yes. Uh, we used to have a medical director uh, some years ago, unfortunately suffered a very, very serious accident, and so we uh, were deprived of this, uh, of this uh, uh, privilege. But we do have an address. We do have people who can answer that address. We did manage uh, over 500 calls from the Greek areas uh, per year. Uh, both, treating, both dealing with emergencies or with sim simple medical info line or with questions about membership and insurance and we have an active uh, first aid educator in the southern, uh, in, in Rhodos who is also taking care of uh, the development of our programs in Italy, what can, uh, in, in Greece, sorry. What can we do more? We now need a new office, we now need a new representation, someone who would be taking care of the uh, diving community that want to know more and to participate more, especially for research, for example, or for training. Where could it be? Could it be in Thessaloniki? Why not? I would say yes, Thessaloniki, because Thessaloniki is the place where you have the most completely diving-oriented and specialized hyperbaric facility. I was so pleased yesterday when I visited the, the, the facility, which I knew already, to see how Dr. Mesimeris is so foreseeing to have availability of breathing, artificial breathing mixtures to treat even difficult cases with the most modern tables and modalities. This is not something, this is not common. The vast majority of hyperbaric facilities all over Europe do not have that which means that Dr. Mesimeris is not only a very qualified hyperbaric phys uh, physician, but is also a diving note. And this is what you need. So actually, and this chamber is by far one of the best chambers that, that you can expect over here in, uh, in Europe. So why not Thessaloniki? I am desperately trying to convince him, which is something that I tried to do already 20 years ago, but he was very stubborn and he said, no, 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 and so I had to go elsewhere. Uh, but I hope that he will now <laughs> accept, and I do hope that with the help of the club and the diving community in Thessaloniki, the help of the staff, which I had the honor and pleasure to meet uh, yesterday at the hyperbaric facility, this will become a reality and we will be able to have an office and, 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 and representatives here to uh, spread and uh, the, the, the mission and the vision of Dan that I hope we all share also in this area of, of Europe. So, again, thank you, Theo, for the invitation. Thank you. Oh, I, I was, you know, last but not least, I was forgetting another thing. You know that, probably you know, that here in Thessaloniki at the university you have one of the laboratories that is doing an extremely innovative research in the prevention of diving uh, decompression diseases. Did you know that? 
I'm, I'm very surprised because he spoke to you here. It's Professor Karapanchas. He's doing something which is not done any other place in the world. And I'm very, very jealous and very curious and, and, and very willing to participate in that. The, the, there are so many assets here to, to start and promoting further development in diving medicine and physiology that it would be... No, I can't see how it, it will not go. So I, I really hope it will go and thank you again. So, should I get on? Very good. Be patient until I find the other one. So, after, say, after telling you what, what Dan is, I will show you the result, one of the results of uh, what I call the participated research. So, what we could do with the participation of and with the active cooperation of the divers. Uh, we started this laboratory, Dan Europe Diving Safety Lab. What is it? It's a longitudinal prospective data collection system that uses divers sending all the dive profiles, a very complete questionnaire, uh, together with many times also physiological data, such as Doppler monitoring and so on, to a central database to be uh, in, included in a, um, in, in a large database that allows for comparison, statistical study, epidemiological study. <coughs> this relates to real dives, not to laboratory dives. So it monitors what the divers really do every day, every time they dive. So it's reality, it's not a lab dive, it's not a guided dive. Uh, the data are inserted in the database for epidemiological analysis. Uh, we extracted a few thousands of these dives to compare them with one of the most <coughs> adopted and known decompression algorithms um, used nowadays, which is the Bullman uh, Zurich 16 model, which stands for 16 tissues with half times. And we analyzed the results of the electronic dye profile and the supersaturation that the tissues had reached with the allowed maximum supersaturation according to the uh, model. You know, you know what supersaturation is. You know that you have to uh, respect certain stops in order not to become too saturated and not to bubble. Uh, and that is the so-called M value. M stands for maximum. So it's the maximum value of nitrogen you can uh, tolerate in your body. Uh, there is I don't know how many of you are technical divers or decompression divers, but there is a, a parameter which is called gradient factor, which is the ratio, the relationship between what you have in your tissues and the maximum you can have. If you have equal to the maximum, your gradient factor will be one. If you have less than the maximum, your gradient factor will be less than one, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, so 70%, something like this. If you are over one, you are beyond over safety. You would need decompression because you can tolerate 100% saturation maximum according to that value. And we studied over these few thousand dives the incidence of decompression illness to see when it happened according to the algorithm and the decompression model. We extracted 40,339944 dives, which were made by 82% by males and 18% by females. The depth range was very, very variable, 5 meters to 192 in technical diving. The average depth of all these 40,000 dives was more or less 30 meters. So uh, the distribution of age ranged from 11 to 80, with an average age of 37.6, 36, 
which happens to be the average age of the, the average diver now. The average age of the diving population has been increasing and now we are approaching 40 years. Most of these divers dive with air. Uh, a few dive with uh, nitrox. Some with trimix. And for some, it was not declared, but we assume it was air. 6,000 of these 40,000 dives were also analyzed by Doppler, and this is a very large number. Uh, I don't know if you know that <coughs> the Bullman model, which you use, or even the American Navy model, a workman model, the compression models, were validated with less than 2,000 dives. Uh, so having 6,000 Dopplers over 40,000 dives is a significant number. 15% Doppler recording of such a large number is good. What happens of bubbles? So what are the results of these things that <coughs> were <coughs> possible due to the cooperation of divers that, as we like to say, donated their dives to research? We understood that most divers are actually bubbling after the dive that bubbles do not form immediately upon surfacing, that is, do not form, probably do not even form significantly during ascent. This may depend on the sensitivity and specificity of the Doppler uh, uh, probes we use, because clearly we are not in the condition to monitor very tiny bubbles. Probably uh, Professor Carapancius will soon be able to provide us with some new technology that will allow that. But at the moment, we are able to monitor bubbles that are considered to be larger than 50 to 100 microns, uh, <coughs> which may take time to, to build. But the end result with uh, uh, acoustic Doppler monitoring is that a diver bubbles from 30 minutes after surfacing in a steady modality for about one hour, 45 minutes, one hour, and then bubbles decrease, but they are still present after 75 minutes, and in some cases after 90 minutes, which means that the first two hours after a dive are relatively dangerous because you may have significant amount of bubbles circulating. <clears throat> there is no big difference between the amount of bubbles circulating after 30 minutes and 45 minutes. So the 30 to 45 minute period after a dive is a critical time where no diver should make significant efforts, where no breath hold diving should be done, where no, no consecutive, no repetitive dive should be done unless taking heavy measures, because there are already many bubbles circulating and that would mean a, an additional risk. Uh, I know that many divers say, I dive with the RGBM bubble model, and the other ones say, I dive with Bullman model, and with the uh, bubble model, or with the uh, uh, deterministic model. So we said, okay, which one is the best? No one is the best, they're just the same. The incidence of problems in the compression illness was exactly the same, as you can see, between the two models. And the rest, 9%, were using tables. So actually, the two current uh, uh, decompression algorithms, which are the most common ones, have more or less the same incidence of problems. And we are talking about 181 incidents, accidents, so it's not a small number. But when we analyze the gradient factor, and I remind you what the gradient factor is, is the ratio is the, uh, between what you have in your tissues, the nitrogen or the inner gas you have in your tissues, and the maximum value that would represent safety. Maximum value is here, 100, 1. This is over, so this would be an unsafe dive a decompression dive, if you don't decompress, you end up right here and you have, you have too, many, too much gas and too many bubbles around. 
One would suppose that if this is the maximum tolerable, if you are below this, you are safe. And this is what your diving tables and your diving computers tell you. So why 60% of the compression illness happens after normal dives? After dives that were considered safe and not needing any decompression. Clearly there is something that needs to be revised. When we looked at 181 accidents out of 40,000 dives, which is the average incidence of decompression illness, we were very surprised by seeing that only very few were above gradient factor one. In other words, the minority of decompression accidents could be expected. The majority of decompression accidents were considered totally unexpected, or as they say, undeserved. But the further surprise came when we <coughs> calculated the average supersaturation of the tissues in those divers, the average G gradient factor. As you can see, we have an average of 0.75 and a median of 0.80. And this is a box plot showing you where the majority of the compression accidents occurred between 0.72 and 0.84. So between 72 and 84 percent of the maximum value. In other words, in safe zone. They shouldn't have happened there. Which means that the new decompression algorithm needs to take that into account. In actual fact, if the ones of you who use Bullman computer, diving computers, or the ones of you who use Sunto, RGBM, Maris, uh, dive computer, PUC, or uh, Nemo, or whatever, so RGBM, or Sunto, or Bullman model, or even the ones of you who may use shear water uh, or VPN uh, uh, variable permeability uh, model uh, Yount or whatever, uh, or use Deco Planner, for example, and set uh, the, the, the various safety zones, you will have noted that all these decompression algorithms now allow you to set the so-called conservatism. And if you use, for example, a Bullman model with a Scuba Pro or an Uvatec computer, you are allowed to set some levels, uh, which were called level stops. The level stops derived from our research. Uh, now they are called PDIS. What do you do by that? You actually reduce the gradient factor high, uh, for those of you who are expert in, in uh, advanced diving, you are reducing high when you don't want to go out of the water, you are reducing gradient factor low when you want to lower your first stop. But this is gradient factor high, so the maximum supersaturation attained by the diver. So by using PDIS, for example, level 5, you, 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 you reduce gradient factor high and you decrease the time or in, increase the stop the safety stop. By using, for example, RGBM with VINCE2, that is the second release of the RGBM, you will be allowed to include a deep stop, a two and a half minute deep stop, and an extra additional safety made of two things. One, age over 40, even if you're not, and the other one is altitude diving because these reduce gradient factors. And in actual fact, these methods reduce bubble production after, after a dive. It's also very nice that Bruce Binke adopted uh, this modality, so we are quite proud that, that we could contribute to this with our, with our study. What, what is then the take-home message? If you use the old system, be aware that whenever you go over 80% of the maximum admitted, you are in a gray area, in a risk zone. Therefore, you should compute your diving 
if you're using, for example, standard unmodified tables or a standard non-conservativism-based computer, make sure that if you go over 80%, you may be in a, in a relatively risk zone. But the other surprise came when we analyzed the 40,000 dives, which is 40,000 divers having made those dives, real divers. And when we put them in a multivariate analysis and uh, calculated the quintiles and the percentiles, this is the surprise. Look what little percentage approached or went over the one GF factor, that is the complete saturation. A minority of divers went there. The vast majority of divers dive very conservatively. They never even reached 80%. 80% of the dives were even below 50% maximum supersaturation. Look at here. 80% of the divers were here. Little, about 20, 15 or so percent were between uh, uh, 50 and 80. Very few were between 72 and 80. And only a few units did dives that went over the maximum allowed uh, uh, concentration. The question that comes to your mind now is, what would have happened if all these 40,000 had died here? How many decompression hits would we, would, would we have had? So, in other words, what we consider safe as an algorithm is not safe. It's safe simply because the divers, we divers, act like fisher, fishers, fishermen. We caught a grouper like this. <laughs> we did a dive, oh, this. The further analysis of the database, which is new data coming out now, is that, for example, the lower the visibility, the lower the gradient factor, the lower the supersaturation, because the diver doesn't want to, to dive in low visibility, so stays conservative. High visibility, mm -mm. I can see the bottom, I take more risk, I get deeper, I get more saturated, I get a higher GF. Uh, th these things are coming out of all the dives that you are donating to the database. These things were, would not have been possible without participation of the divers. But this is what is really important. Diving is now safe because divers are prudent, not because methods are safe. So take this message home. Keep being prudent. Otherwise, if you end up diving in this area, the chances to have a hit are much higher. If we compare the incidence of decompression accidents for gradient factor lower than 70% and higher than 70%, that is 70% of the maximum, safe, you will see that there is an inversion of incidence of de decompression illness to no decompression illness. Under 0.7, you have very little DCS and high majority of normal, normal, normal dives. Over 70%, the majority is DCS, as opposed to non-accidents. So, conclusions. If we are to consider the recommendation of the current algorithms, we'd say that most divers dive in a safe area because very little go over 100%. But we also know that divers normally tend to dive very conservatively. Luckily, I would say, fortunately. And the other take-home message for us, for us physiologists and doctors, uh, diving doctors, is that all the current algorithms still allow for a gray zone in their ability to predict decompression illness. So they are not accurate predictor of risk. And this is not a surprise because if you go looking at, for example, the US Navy diving manual uh, where the, most of the decompression models refer to because the, decompre the deterministic decompression models such as Bullman 
originally have been elaborated in their initial formula by a, a naval officer uh, workman uh, of, the, of the US Navy and are published in the uh, US Navy Diving Manual. If you read carefully the US Navy Diving Manual, you will see that they report an incidence of decompression accidents when respecting the tables, which is over 6%, which is obviously probably tolerable for a military diver, even if now, even, even in the military, I don't think that hit, I mean, injuring a diver is, is something accepted, but we are probably tolerable for military diver in high-risk missions, but they are definitely not tolerable for, for a recreational diver. Would you agree? So this is no surprise. This is no surprise that the current algorithms show a gray zone. But this is the first time, to my knowledge, that it could be demonstrated with an epidemiologically valid study with large data. <coughs> and this is a stimulus for us to continue with collection of data to improve and increase the numbers. We want to reach several hundred thousands. We are now at already 70,000 dives, and instead of 181, we already have 342 cases, but the data are being confirmed. Uh, and this is what we hope to keep on doing with your cooperation and with receiving more and more data from divers, and I do hope that if we start uh, with some action, with the cooperation of, of the uh, Thessaloniki Divers Club, with the cooperation of the, Dr. Mesimeris, with Professor Carapantios, with the Hyperbaric Center, with the colleagues uh, working in the Hyperbaric Center and with the help of the university and so on, this area where everything started with the Vega Alexandros uh, some 2,000 years ago can yet become a cradle of development for diving physiology and medicine. Thank you very much. Dr. Maroni, have you heard of a diving action strategy called ratio deco? For what? Ratio deco. Yes. Yes. What are your thoughts about the strategy? It has some reason. Um, it's, if well applied, it's relatively safe because it's quite conservative. And it has to be because it goes by memory, by the, by the way. So yes, uh, it's no problem. Uh, it's one of the um, models that we are considering and studying, actually. I can't tell you much more. I know, I know the, uh, unfortunately, I also know some accidents. Uh, out of that, but it has a reason, it, it has some logics uh, behind it, it goes along uh, similar uh, pathways of, of uh, evaluation of the maximum supersaturation that you're going to tolerate, especially according to the length, you know that, uh, the, the duration of the dive and uh, the possible compartments that you are going to interest. Yes, it is, but it's essentially it's a deterministic method, it's not a bubble-based method, so it's based on uh, determination of the maximum attained supersaturation, and then you go. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Sandro, may I make a question? What do you propose about the philosophy of the deep stops concerning the new approach to this? Uh, Matter. According to your experience, of course. Uh, deep the compression stops, of course. You're talking about deep diving or recreational diving? No, I'm talking about recreational diving, at less, not exaggerating the 40 meters. Okay. 580. Um, well, uh, I have some slides, but I can talk about it. Um, we did, we started the study uh, by uh, comparing uh, recreational diving, no decompression dive, 
25 meter, 25 minutes, followed after three hours by a repetitive dive to 25 for 20 minutes, which is a dive that uh, brings you to roughly a GF of uh, 0 0.7908. 0 uh, so it's in the gray zone. Um, the vast majority of the ones who did not do any stop, so direct ascent according to the very first uh, tables, uh, were bubbling, significantly bubbling, although we didn't have any accident. But uh, they were bubbling at uh, so-called grade four. So uh, every heart cycle had many bubbles uh, that, that could be recorded. When introducing the safety stop, this reduced but not so significantly. When varying the uh, speed of ascent, the only significant variation was a very slow ascent, very slow linear ascent, which was associated with many bubbles. Strangely enough, uh, a steep ascent was less bubbly that than a, a very slow ascent, and that's another take-home message. The speed, the relative speed of ascent, the so-called intermediate speed of ascent, did not seem to uh, produce many, many changes in bubbling. Uh, what really produced the change was when we uh, cut the delta P, cut the uh, pressure differential, and started uh, uh, the stopping the diver deeper than the safety stop. We started with halving the depth, uh, then we halved the uh, absolute pressure, but there's always a five meter differential. So. And by adding a deep stop of one minute, we didn't produce any, any clear advantage. When we added a deep stop of two and a half minutes, the uh, level of bubbles monitored after these dives dramatically dropped. Um, both at half the depth and half the absolute pressure. We even tested dives where ten, with 10 minutes deep stop and no other stop and they were not bubbling after that. In the end, we tested also dives from 18, because there's no reason to, to do a deep stop after an 18 meter dive, it's at safety stop level. Uh, so we tested dives from 18 to 42, that is the recreational diving range, and surprisingly, the best results of the deep stop were in the pure recreational diving area, so 20 to 25 to 30, 32. At 40 meters, the, the situation is slightly different uh, and we are still studying the best modality. But in the normal recreational diving range, our experience is that a deep stop helps reducing circulating bubble after the, after the dive. It doesn't need to be a one minute stop because that's not effective, it should be a two minute stop, which is what the new models, the new RGBM 2 and even PDIS, the new UVATEC, uh, one way or the other, say. With the UVATEC, you, don't, you never end up at mid-depth, uh, you end up at mid-absolute uh, pressure, or you start with a deep stop at 15 to 12 meters, but more or less in this range we are in, in, that, in that area. With RGBM, too, Vinke introduced the half the depth. But that's a different story when you talk about decompression dives, or technical dives, entirely different, entirely different. So it shouldn't be applied with the same philosophy. Sandro, just a bit to translate uh, in Greek. The question that you asked, Mr. Maroni, is that the question of the impact of the impact of the impact of the impact is in a place where you can see that it's up to 30 to 35 meters. In a way, the impact of των μοντέλων τόσο των πειραματικών όσο και των κλινικών που έχουν καταγραφεί προτείνει ένα μοντέλο είτε λόγω ε, αναλογίας με πίεση είτε λόγω αναλογίας ε, με βάθος περίπου στα μισά με ένα στόπ που δεν θα είναι πάνω από 2-2,5 λεπτά ώστε να μπορέσει να μην προβλεφθεί χρόνος επιπλέον κορεσμού των ιστών. Άρα 
Υπάρχει μια διαφοροποίηση στα κλασικά μοντέλα που έχουν τα 9-6-3 μέτρα, ώστε να μπορεί κάποιο να έχει ένα βαθύτερο, ένα ασφαλέστερο σημείο συγκριτικά με, τον, με τη σχέση που έδειξε πριν κορεσμού ε, των ιστών. Επομένω, υπάρχει μια φιλοσοφία σήμερα η οποία τίνει να αυξήσει κάπω την πρώτη στάση αποσυμπίεση, ώστε να υπάρχει ένα ασφαλέστερο προφίλ όσον αφορά την καταδυτική εκτίμηση του υπερκορεσμού. Αν κάποιο θέλει να ρωτήσει κάτι, μπορούμε να το μεταφράσουμε για να μην προσπαθούμε να μιλάμε μόνο εγγλέζικα. Show the, the data, but visually probably it's, it's more, it's clearer. So we're talking about dives between 18 and 30 meters, 32. You have many bubbles if your fast tissues, that is the blood, the highly perfused tissues, reach a maximum level of 80% of the maximum allowed. <clears throat> if you do a dive without any stop at 10 or 3 meter uh, uh, per minute ascent, you have high bubble grapes. If you do a safety stop, 18 meter per, uh, meet per minute as speed of ascent, you have bubbles. If you do three meter per minute speed of ascent, you have bubbles. 10 meter per minute seems to be the optimal uh, speed of ascent in general. This is the border between many bubbles and low bubbles. Just a minute to translate if you wish. Ε, ο Δόκ Μαρόνι εδώ μας δείχνει ότι σημασία για την παραγωγή φυσαλίδων έχει η ταχύτητα με την οποία αν ένας δίτης επιστρέφει στην επιφάνεια μετά μια αεραστηγική κατάδυση μέχρι τα 30-35 μέτρα στην οποία βλέπουμε ότι ανάλογα με το στόπ και ανάλογα με την ταχύτητα ανόδου η ταχύτηση περίπου των 10 μέτρων ήταν αυτή που δεν επιβάρηνε, δεν προκάλεσε δηλαδή αύξηση του περιπορισμού Οπότε είχαμε ένα low bubble gradient, για να, ένα χαμηλό δηλαδή βαθμό φυσταλίδων, ώστε να είναι ασφαλέστερη η κατάδυση. Λίσαν. And this is what you get if you add a, safe, a deep stop in these recreational dives. As you see, again, with 10 meter per minute you have the best results. With the, even with the others you have good results. But definitely the amount of bubbles after these dives drop down. Βλέπετε <laughs> Βλέπετε τη διαφορά ε, στο δεξί μέρος της διαφάνειας με την κόκκινη γραμμή που ήταν τα deep stop, δηλαδή οι βαθύτερες στάσεις αποσυμβίεσης στις οποίες φαίνεται ξεκάθαρα πόσο αλατώθηκε το πλήθος των φυσαλίδων ακόμα και αν αυτές δεν ε, είχαν κλινική εκδήλωση οι λεγόμενες silent bubbles που φιλτράρονται στο πνευμανικό παρέχημα. Επομένως ε, υπάρχει μια σαφής διαφοροποίηση που κάνει ασφαλέστερη την κατάδυση χρησιμοποιώντας πάντοτε με μέτρο βέβαια τις βαθύτερες, τα βαθύτερα στόπ. Αυτό είναι η διαφορά between the length of deep stop. The best length was two and a half minutes deep stop. With 10 minutes, you reduced the bubbles, but you still have some bubbles. With two minutes, you still have a little too many high-grade bubbles. Look at with one minute what happened. It's almost like a linear ascent, very slow. So the, again, the old, good old golden rule, 10 meter per minute, is still valid. It's much better. You know the history of the 18 meter per minute? It's not scientific. 60 foot, 60 seconds, it's easy to follow on your watch. 60 foot per minute, 60 seconds, uh -uh. easy. That's it. Only that. No science. Εδώ, εδώ ο Σάνδρο μα έδειξε ότι το χρονικό διάστημα αυτών των στόπων είναι που καθορίζει κατά πόσο είναι πλάς, είναι συν ή μείον η χρήση των, βα... των βαθιών στόπ. Επομένως, ο χρόνος έχει σημασία που πρέπει είτε να είναι λίγο μεγαλύτερος από το 1,5-2 λεφτά, είτε μικρότερος από το επόμενο διάστημα, 
ώστε να μην κορεστούν οι ιστοί ακόμα και σε αυτό το βάθος των βαθαίων στόπ. Γιατί και στο βάθος των βαθαίων στα deep stop συνεχίζει να φορτώνει το ιστός με το κύμα του κορεσμού. Ανεξάρτητα αν έχει μειωθεί ένα προς δύο τουλάχιστον η σχέση της πίεσης. I want to ask also one question. Uh, is there any research from Dan uh, considering the, the use of uh, rebreathers uh, from uh, amateur divers? Yes. Uh, can I show you something first? Αυτό που ρώτησα είναι ότι αν υπάρχει κάποια έρευνα, κάποιο πρόγραμμα έρευνα τη ΔΑΝ σε σχέση με τη χρήση των rebreather από αεραστέχνε δίτε. It's not a very good period for. But look at from, 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 from uh, yeah. Greek to ask about rebreathers. But uh, I wanted to show you something else now because I want to show you what real divers can do, real bubbles after diving. For example, in this pool, which is Nemo 33 in Brussels. Now we have a very nice pool, you're all invited, uh, in Padova. It's a 40 meter pool, thermal water, pure, beautiful pool, and we have a lab there. Now look at what a 25 meter, 25 minute dive can do in the heart of a diver, and look at this area here. And you see some, now there is light here, but you will see, especially at the start of the recording, you see a number of small, tiny, bright objects. These are bubbles. These are not injected bubbles. These are not diagnostic bubbles. These are nitrogen bubbles in a diver after a very, very normal dive. And we are seeing these bubbles even in the left part of the heart. So, uh, rebreather. Yes, we do have some <coughs> research in that. Um, we essentially we are monitoring uh, oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production in rebreathers because that is the danger essentially uh, and we have uh, developed a modality I don't know if I have the picture here to show you uh, probably yes but I'm not sure if I can find it no not here Anyway, we have developed a uh, sensor, infrared sensor, that goes in the mouthpiece of the uh, rebreather circuit, of the loop, and uh, <coughs> we can monitor heart rate, oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, therefore also effort, uh, oxygen uh, use of the diver, because the main risk of the of, of rebreather, as you will know, uh, is not only decompression illness, but it's essentially carbon dioxide accum accumulation, and the vast majority of rebreather fatalities were actually carbon dioxide fatalities. Loss of consciousness, blackout, deep water blackout to carbon dioxide, and so if you can monitor that, and if the diver can have something on, on the display on his computer showing alarms before the, 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 the situation becomes critical, it's, it's an additional safety measure. We're also measuring the incidence of decompression illness in these divers, and we are now collecting divers with the help of a technical diver association in Europe that are donating their dives regularly. Uh, ε, υπάρχει αυτή τη στιγμή μια έρευνα της DAN για την, ε, με την ε, βοήθεια ενός σένσορα ε, στο σημείο εισόδου των αερίων στους ρεμπρίδες που μετράει κυρίως την, ε, το διοξείδιο του άνθρακα. Ε, ο κύριος παράγοντας επιχειρημάτων στους ρεμπρίδες είναι η εισπνοή, η, μεγάλη ψώτητα, η αύξηση του ποσοστού διοξείδιου του άνθρακα στο αέριο. Ε, και σε αυτό το τομέα υπάρχει συνεργασία με το μια υπηρεσία τεχνικής κατάδυσης, αν θυμάμαι καλά, που προχωράει την, την έρευνα. Yes, <laughs> repetitive dice, very interesting question. Uh, let me see if I have something to show you. Mm, here, yeah. Now. <clears throat> Now, 
I will show you what we what we came up to with with the study of repetitive dives. And I will help myself with this. Uh, as, as I told you, we do research camps. And during these research camps, with, with the help of divers, and maybe we can, we will be able to organize a research camp here in Kalkidiki, uh, which I would love to, to visit, by the way. Uh, what we do, we ask divers to do their dives, and when they come up, we monitor the divers, and we do a lot of things, including, for example, measuring hematocrit, that is the viscosity of blood, measuring the density of urine to measure their uh, dehydration. <coughs> uh, this is hematocrit. We also, well, this you have seen. Uh, we do pulmonary echography to see what the lung stress is. And we do bioimpedance measurement uh, so that we can see what the distribution of fluid is. By, uh, from, from all that, we can get some data. And for example, these are data coming after a one day a research camp where we had 90 divers diving from 40 to 120 meters. And we measured hematocrit and blood concentration. And we had a very nice surprise because we thought, as we everybody, as everybody thinks, that uh, diving is dehydrating. So we should have a dehydrated diver after the first dive. And the hematocrit, which is a sign of hydration or dehydration of the blood, should be high. There should be more cells and less fluid because diving makes you pee. It's the P effect of diving, okay? And, but that is a surprise. We found a low hematocrit after the first dive. Why? Because diving makes you lose water, not gain water. So we monitored what happened of the hematocrit in the surface interval between the two dives. And look, hematocrit went up, and again went up after the second dive, repetitive dive. So what happened? A very simple thing. Our organisms, like homeostasis, which is a Greek term in my ancient and, and, and medical Greek. How do you say it? Homeostasis. So the only wrong thing was the accent. That's good. Uh, so our body likes homeostasis. And if you are deprived of water, the blood is deprived of water, the first thing it does is go look for water somewhere. Therefore, it borrows water from the surrounding tissues, from interstitial tissues, from uh, essentially from the interstitial, and put, pumps it into the blood flow. And therefore, you have a reduced hematocrit. But it's a very transient thing, because for homeostasis, it needs to re-equilibrate, and shortly after, the debt is paid. And the loss of water is shown. The second dive, you do the same, but you have lost the possibility to borrow water. You cannot borrow any more water, and so you become more dehydrated. And this is why we could explain the very first things we had seen years before, which is what happens after a repetitive dive in terms of bubbles. This is the curve of bubbles after first dive. 70% of dives have no significant amount of bubbles. Only 30% have bubbles, and even less, about 15% have bubbles in high grades. When you, when you analyze repetitive dives only, the proportion is reversed. The minority of repetitive dives have no bubble. The majority of repetitive dives have very many bubbles. And we think 
that this is also linked to hydration and dehydration because there is a physical force in nature which is called surface tension. Surface tension is what keeps together the soap bubbles. Uh, and the smaller the, the bubble, the higher the surface tension, the higher the pressure. So a small bubble, pressure on the bubble that keeps the bubble together. Large bubble, no pressure, bubble explodes. But if we look at the surface tension of our body, fluids, and we measure the surface tension of urine, we see that the surface tension of urine is very similar to the surface tension of blood and plasma. And if we analyze the urine and we see, and we try to see what surface tension we have in very diluted, very hydrated urine or very concentrated urine, a dehydrated person, we see that the surface tension of a dehydrated person is low and the surface tension of a hydrated person is very high. If you have high surface tension, there is a force that prevents the bubble from growing. So another thing that helps you. And this is the reason why hyperhydration is one of the most important preventive factors in preventing bubbling. This is a dive, 45 meters, 20 minutes, which we did with military dive, divers, the French divers. We, this is a study that we did with the French Navy. And this is the difference between normal hydrated and hyperhydrated, not even dehydrated. This is the bubble production of normal hydrated military divers of the French Navy, and this is the bubble production, almost none, uh, for when, when they were hyperhydrated. How do you hyperhydrate a diver? Very simple. Water, not immediately, because if you load yourself with water, with a bolus of water, you will pee immediately. But if you drink, say, 200 mils every 15 minutes and keep on going, this water will distribute in your tissues before, before going out. And so you will be a little hyperhydrated, and this is a good protection factor, especially to answer our friend's uh, answer, uh, our friend's question, especially for repetitive dives, because repetitive dives are at more risk of bubbling for the reasons that I showed you. Um, what is the contribution of Dan in the um, uh, technical diving community, not only to, in, in the individual divers who now going out from the recreational area to technical diving area, but also to the um, organizations who are promoting the, uh, the um, technical diving? It's, it's a difficult area, as you know, because of the many opinions, uh, many modalities, the uh, peculiar, peculiar interest pers personalities in that, in that uh, environment, and the tendentially high-risk taking attitude uh, of, of, these, uh, of these divers. Fortunately, we agreed with GOE uh, in, in all over Europe, and we are now conducting a uh, epidemiological analysis, a, data, a longitudinal data collection with them. Uh, many of the divers that I reported here were actually technical divers because in that uh, uh, research camp where we had 90 divers in the water, about 30 were technical diving doing uh, either a reader or open circuit uh, uh, trimix dives in a lake <coughs> up to about 130 meters there in the, in the Lake uh, Maggiore. So we, part of the data that we collect have a value also for technical diving, because they have an absolute value for, for the diving stress and decompression stress in general. But with special regard to rebreather diving, we are now starting a study which starts from the parameters that I illustrated before. And now that we have agreed with a large community of, of technical divers uh, that, that they will contribute producing and providing, regularly providing data, clearly we will hopefully soon have enough numbers to start 
analyzing a database and to start uh, possibly uh, having some opinions. But without numbers, you 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 don't have you cannot have opinions. You you only have guesses. Uh, so at the moment, unfortunately, um, medical uh, um, medical research on on uh, rebreathers and deep diving is essentially utopic. And we would like to avoid that, you know, and start doing some prevention. But so far, the only reliable research data we have is on fatalities. Why uh, don't you give your um, statistics to computer manufacturers? Have you already discussed about it with them? Or? Mm, many of them have already used them. Really? Yes. Uh, Bruce Winker has implemented uh, uh, our uh, deep stop system in the new RGBN2. And if you look at the Uvatec system, the old smart computer with level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 deep stop was derived from the, the very first thing. Now the new thing, uh, what we call the gradient factor modality, is being discussed with a few dive manufacturers. But uh, at the moment we are in the process to uh, actually design the new algorithm to test and validate it, and then we will release it. But we want to make it a public source, open source. We, we don't like to, to make it a proprietary something because uh, this, is, this is a matter of safety. We, we, when we will have enough uh, certainty that the data are reliable, we will publish and make it available. And uh, one more thing, I'm sorry. Uh, many divers seem to, especially in uh, vacation, repetitive dives, seem to make very long stops in five meters or maybe at 10 at the beginning and then around 5, really long stops until the air is almost finished and then they come to the surface. You think this is not so safe according to what you said uh, previously? Mm, I personally I think that it's useless but not dangerous if it's kept in the five, three to five meter area. Because at that stage, if you have done uh, a deep stop, you are already, you, you have gotten rid of many bubbles. If you didn't, the main effect of the safety stop has been attained in the first three to five minutes. After that, the supersaturation of slow tissues that you may risk is negligible. So it's essentially useless, but it's fun. So why not? <laughs> Could, Dr. Maroni, could you comment on the use of, uh, yeah, of opening the oxygen window as a useful strategy for lowering bubble production? Definitely, it's, it's, it's a major issue. Major issue. Opening the oxygen window is, is something that we are seeing, for example, and we think that, that that is the mechanism underneath that issue, we are seeing in this. <clears throat> this is nitrox dive, this is air dive with equivalent nitrox, uh, with equivalent inner, ga inner gas upload. So theoretically speaking, if you have an equivalent inner gas upload, an uptake, you should have exactly the same risk in terms of decompression. Nevertheless, with the same exposure to inner gas, if you use nitrox, you have less bubbles. And we believe that that is a, a result of implementing the oxygen window. So definitely, the oxygen window is part of the uh, uh, modality of, of computing with the, uh, let's say, with the long exposure, so definitely so. Obviously, the major implementation of oxygen window is what we do in, in uh, therapy and in first aid, because by providing 
100% oxygen, actually you use that because you open up the oxygen windows entirely. But in breathing mix, uh, diving, this is something that we found with a certain surprise because we were expecting to find equal amount of bubbles for equal amounts of equivalent amounts of inner gas uploaded. But when we used hyperoxygenated mixtures with the same gas upload calculated, we had less bubbles. So I think that is one of the marvels of, of oxygen window. Κάποια άλλη ερώτηση που θα ήθελε να υποβάλει κάποιο. Όχι, κάνε το μεταφραστή γιατί δεν ξέρω. Θα προσπαθήσω. Δεν ξέρω αγγλικά, δεν κατάλαβα τη διάλεξη καθόλου. Απλώ θέλω να ρωτήσω μόνο για την αποποίηση που έλεγε. Τι γνώμη έχει. Μπορεί να το έχει πει, ε, γιατί δεν το κατάλαβα εγώ. Λοιπόν, ε, τι γνώμη έχει για την αποποίηση με σκέτο οξυγόνο. Αυτό που είναι και μειώνει και του χρόνου αποποίηση. Uh, the only the, word I understood is oxygen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the question is, uh, what about the use of uh, pure oxygen for decompression? Definitely no problem. Definitely no problem, as long as you consider oxygen toxicity on the one hand. So clearly, this should be done not at significant depths. Ideally, even 1.8 can be uh, dangerous, especially after exposure to, for example, cold water with vasoconstriction and other things. So uh, even 1.5, so 5 meters is critical. Δεν υπάρχει πρόβλημα με τη χρήση του οξυγόνου, αρκεί να χρησιμοποιεί την αναλαμβάνει υπόψη η τοξικότητα του οξυγόνου, δηλαδή η χρήση του στα βάθη που επιτρέπεται. Με μερικέ πιέσει από 1,8 μέχρι 1,5. So when using oxygen for decompression, you have to take into account the oxygen toxic unit, so the the uh, the uh, central nervous system uh, possible uh, toxicity that you have already reached by diving deep. That would mean no sense in using oxygen for shallow diving. So you have done a deep dive. You have already been exposed to a certain amount of significant oxygen, high partial pressure. If you add further 100% oxygen, say at, one point, at five meters, you have 1.5, uh, 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 and 1.5 is a borderline uh, concentration of oxygen. So ideally, you should be lower than 1.4, so 1.3, 3, 4 meters. Then there is an additional problem. Can I translate? Oh, yes, okay. Ε, αν θυμάμαι καλά την απάντηση ολόκληρη, ε, το οξυγόνο δράσει σωρευτικά, δηλαδή ο οργανισμός φορτίζεται ε, και κατά τη διάρκεια της κατάδυσης. Οπότε αν έχουμε κάνει μια βαθιά κατάδυση, ήδη ο οργανισμός έχει απορροφήσει η ιστή του, αν το λέω καλά δίθυντα, ε, οξυγόνο, οπότε θα πρέπει να είμαστε ακόμα πιο συντηρητικοί στην αποσυμπίεση με καθαρό οξυγόνο, δηλαδή να μην επιβαρύνουμε προσοχή, να μην επιβαρύνουμε επιπλέον τον οργανισμό, ώστε να του προκαλέσουμε την τοξικότητα. Then there is an additional problem to take into account when considering oxygen decompression, and that is the oxygen uh, uh, caused vasoconstriction. Can you repeat, please? The, the vasoconstriction that oxygen causes. Θα πρέπει να, επίσης, ένας επιπλέον παράδοσος που θα πρέπει να ληφθεί υπόψη είναι η αγιοσύσπαση που προκαλεί το, το οξυγόνο. Which means that the theoretical washout, if you take into account the mathematical formula and put oxygen as the breathing gas, there would be a theoretical washout, which takes into account a, a, a theoretical blood flow. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Ο κύριο Μαρόνι είπε ότι ένα επιπλέον παράγον που μπορεί να επηρεάσει την παρουσία του οξυγόνου εκτό από την παρουσία δηλαδή του βάθου με ένα όριο ασφαλεία στα 5 μέτρα είναι η αγιοσύσπαση. Ο οργανισμό δεν έχει μάθει να δουλεύει με καλά ποστά οξυγόνου. Οπότε το πρώτο που κάνει για να προφυλαχθεί είναι να κάνει αγιοσύσπαση. Με αυτή είναι η θεωρητική τουλάχιστον αγιοσύσπαση. Το ξέπλυμα του αζότου μέσα από ένα σωλήνα με μικρότερη διάμετρο θα επηρεαστεί, άρα θα παραταθεί η έκπληση του αζότου στη διάρκεια της αποσυμπίησης. Βέβαια, αυτό είναι λίγο πιο θεωρητικά, τελείως θεωρητικό, αλλά είναι μια άποψη. Το γεγονός είναι ότι η χρήση του οξυγόνου στα αργά μέτρα 
είναι κάτι πάρα πολύ βοηθητικό και πάρα πολύ ασφαλές για να μπορέσει κανεί να ξεκινήσει. So the so the decompression tables that use oxygen, pure oxygen for decompression, should be uh, adapted to vasoconstriction, to temperature, and to previous exposure. Uh, when I was working with the commercial diving uh, in the North Sea, we did use ox pure oxygen for decompression, and when using theoretically calculated tables, we had a lot of accidents because with vasoconstriction, obviously, the washout of nitrogen is impeded. And until we adapted the time as if uh, we had lo be a lower flow, we did not correct the problem. So that, that is one thing to take in mind. Other than that, it's obviously good. Milondo ke pangelmatikes katavisis, sti vorio thalasa, sinietos i pangelmatikes di, so biun πίνακες από συμβίες που περιέχουν οξυγόνο στα τελευταία μέτρα. Εξαρτάται όμως από την θερμοκρασία, από την φόρτωση που είχαν ανάλογα τα, τα μέτρα που βουτούσαν, γιατί φανταστείτε ότι ένα μείγμα με μια μεγάλη περιεκτικότητα οξυγόνου, ας πούμε ότι πλησιάζει αυτή του αέρα, στις 6 ατμόσφαιρες, δηλαδή στα 50 μέτρα ή στα, στα 100 μέτρα που είναι 11 ατμόσφαιρες, αν απολαυσιάσετε την περιεκτικότητα οξυγόνου, θα ανέβει αμέσως η επίδραση του οξυγόνου στον οργανισμό. Επομένω. Θα έπρεπε να υπάρχει ένας λογάριθμος που να μειώνει την εισπνοή οξυγόνου σε σχέση με τη θερμοκρασία, η οποία προκαλεί και η ίδια εγγυοσύσπαση, και σε σχέση με την τοξικότητα που έχει επιφέρει η αναπνοή του οξυγόνου έμεσα, σαν μείγμα, σαν ποσοστό μείγματος δηλαδή, στο βάθος. Επομένως, λέει ο Σάνδρο ότι πολλά περιστατικά στη Βόρεια Θάλασσα είχαν παρουσιάσει την τοξικότητα οξυγόνου πριν ε, ξεκαθαρίσουν κάποια σημεία από πλευράς ασφάλεια. Υπάρχουν αυτοί οι πίνακε αποσυμπίεσης και συνήθω η αποσυμπίεση των οξυγόνων γίνεται λίγο πριν τη δείξει εντό εισαγωγικών ο Δίτ πάνω στην επιφάνεια και κάνει την αποσυμπίεση βέβαια μέσα στο θάλαμο. Γιατί όλε οι αποσυμπίεσει σε αυτά τα περιβάλλοντα γίνονται σερφα αντικοπρέσιμε. Δηλαδή εισπνέουν οξυγόνο και μπαίνουν στο θάλαμο για να κάνουν αποσυμπίεση με ασφαλεί συνθήκε. Your speech is live to, to the internet. So uh, the question is: Is there a, an affection of smoking uh, to to diving, and uh, what uh, a diver must uh, consider? Smoking, smoking. Smoking. There is no scientific data about that. Number one. Number two, there is some unproven, not evidence, but data that suggests that there may be a higher susceptibility to decompression in this. This was a uh, rumor, something that was feared, but so far there is no real evidence that there is such a correlation. Um, clearly, The only real risk in smoking is how smoke, smoking affects the uh, airways uh, and how it affects especially the small to medium airways uh, where the uh, ability to exhale can be uh, impaired. Therefore, there can be a reduced uh, flow of gas coming out of the alveoli, especially if smoking has already caused some pulmonary disease such as emphysema or something like it. And there is a theoretically increased risk of pulmonary barotrauma and arterial gas embolism. But there is no real, other than the common sense, uh, politically correct uh, Uh, recommendations that, that there is no research actually. Τελευταίο όρο δεν του κατάλαβα, γιατρέ. Αυτό που κατάλαβα είναι ότι πρώτον δεν υπάρχουν πολλά επιστημονικά δεδομένα που θα μπορούσαν να συνδέσουν την επίδραση του καπνίσματο στην κατάδυση. Και αυτό που υπάρχει σαν υποψία είναι ότι μπορεί να επηρεάσει του αεραγωγού έτσι ώστε να εμποδίσει την, ε, τη μετάδοση, τη μεταφορά ε, αερίων μεταξύ των ιστών. Ε, ε, αυτό. You agree to it, ε, Αν δεν υπάρχει άλλη ερώτηση, 
Υπάρχει. Ε, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ τον ε, καθηγητή Μαρόνι. Ευχαριστώ. πάρα πολύ. How to say many times. Πολύ ευχαριστώ. Πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Πάρα πολύ. I have to I have to go to my to my Greek again. Huh? Hilia Kalisto. One thousand. Hilia. Oh, it's Grazie mille. Okay, una faccia una razza. All right. Thank you. Oh, how nice. How nice. How nice. It's great. It's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. EasyJet will love it. <laughs> uh, I, I must always transfer the, uh, the greetings and uh, many thank you from, uh, from Athens, from people from Athens that are watching us live. Thank you very much. Technology. Yeah, this is marvelous. <laughs> Thank you again, once again. Hilia Haristo. <laughs>